What you got? Okay, let's Are do you this. you focusing on that? Yeah, right there. Okay, this is... Uh, you got a little glare off the light. what we what call ostraca. Can you say the word ostraca? Ostraca. ostraca. That's a fancy name for a bunch of pottery shards. But this is uh, when Sam and I, in 1979, went to Turkey, which is the Seven Churches of Asia. And they had a bunch of gravel on the walkway, and in there we found a lot of pieces of, of marble and oh. pottery. And the interesting thing was the glaze, where we had white glaze and green glaze and kind of a glaze, glassy kind of a pottery, dark blackish grayish glaze and the light green. And these were all particularly around Byzantine period. Byzantine would be anything after Constantine. Uh, 800, say 800, 900s, but uh, that was that particular. We found some coin. One of the coins we found was Aretas out of Petra. It was dated 9 BC to 40 AD, wow. and Aretas was the Nabataean who happened to. Uh, there's the daughter of Pacellus who married Herod Antipas in 4 BC in AD 39. They divorced, so they didn't live happily ever after, but Herod married a Petra or Nabataean, which is a fancy word for an Arab, uh, camel, camel jockey people. But this was all in Turkey, and Turkey is a lot like, I'm going to say it's a lot like West Virginia and Virginia, but without <coughs> so many trees. <laughs> barren hills. And barren hills, yeah, a lot of, a lot of hills, but pretty well barren. It, it just, there's a little scrub here and a little scrub there. And I remember our bus driver drove here, got a long line to get gasoline. We went from small village to small village to small village just trying to find gas. So we're going to pass this around and give you an idea of some of the stuff dealing with uh, Turkey in that particular Petra. period of time. Some of it's Petra and some of it's Asia Minor, which is Turkey. We discussed last week, and we'll just do a little review, that says there are four basic views of uh, Revelation. One is the historicist view, and that is where it's an unfolding of history from the day of John writing Revelation, 96 AD, until Jesus comes again. 2,000 years plus of history. And that is the position the church took for 1,850 years. That was the majority position. The uh, Historicist of Revelation talked about uh, this particular time frame, and then it's a history textbook of the past, present, and future, and finally the, uh, we understand those events in Revelation as symbolic. They describe historical events throughout church history. And the second view is the Predish view that it is news, uh, it's current, it's for right now, that everything was fulfilled by 70 AD, and this is a position most Roman Catholics take as far as Roman Catholic leadership. The reason they take this position is everything was fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD and therefore the Pope could not be the Antichrist because all this history had taken place before there ever was a Pope. Unless Peter was the first Pope. But then Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. And if Peter had a mother-in-law, that means Peter had a wife. What? That happened at what? Uh -huh. If Peter had a mother-in-law, what does Peter have to have? A wife. Oh, wow. Thank you. I want to hear it now. Yeah. Had a wife. Oh, I thought, I thought yeah. he and if he's the first pope, he's the first pope that had a wife. Yeah. Yeah. I thought oh, yeah. he had sworn to celibacy. But then you'll find in reading the Catholic Bible, there's a footnote that the scripture that talks about forbidding to marry and uh, forbidding and abstaining from meats. The footnote says that this was the later ecclesiastical decision rather than current. So these things came on after. It's like I was sharing with you uh, some month ago when this group went down into a Catholic cathedral and there's a tapestry for immersions down in the basement. And they asked the priest, who was their guide, do they use that anymore? And the priest was very honest. Men change things. Right. What did he say? Men <coughs> change things. So he had to be an honest priest. Yeah. Well, this is Revelation is like an ancient newspaper that fulfilled everything by apparently the uh, the uh, 70 AD. And then uh, your your next group would be your, your futurist, 
A futurist is, is one who believes that Revelation is a prophecy. Everything's going to happen past 2015. Everything's going to be from here on out. It's going to be tomorrow's news, today. So the Bible was silent for 2,000 years. Now we look at the Old Testament, and the Bible was silent for, between Malachi and Matthew, how long was the Bible silent? 400 years. Uh, 400 Less years. About. There's no uh, king in Israel, no prophet in Israel, every man did that which was right in their own eyes. The only thing interesting is, during that 400 years, was a golden age for Israel, yep. before the Romans came on. <laughs> And a lot of the millennial teaching today, premillennial teaching about a future golden age for Israel, actually is past history because during that 400 years of silence was actually 300 years of that was the golden age for Israel. Uh, that's where it said the Jordan Valley bloomed, and there was gardens along the Dead Sea, and it was a blessed land. It was a, an abundant land, not uh, the desolate. Dead Sea as we know it today, but it was part of the rain too. It was it was a, it was a garden spot of the world for several centuries, and we'll get into that when we get into more Fred Miller's book on Zechariah, and we'll allude to it as we go along. Now, Revelation is supposed to be like a roadmap for the future, and the future's view all or nearly all of Revelation is yet to occur. Now, I did an interesting study this afternoon on blood moons. And uh, the blood moon, it's actually the moon solar eclipse, where the, actually the moon, the earth is in between the sun and the moon, and the sun actually shines on the earth, and as the sun shines on the earth, the diffusion of rays, the blue rays go out, and the red rays are burnt, bent around the earth, and they beam upon the, the moon with, with either pink or or a bloody red. Do you know how many blood moons, red moons there are every year? How many? Two yeah. every year. Two every year. And there's a certain where there's four blood moons in a row, and that's happened about seven or eight times in the last 1,500 years. Where they actually have one, and then <coughs> another, and another, and another, where there's about a month in between. And so that's not, it's not completely formed. It's not completely uh, a non-entity. It does happen. But normally, twice a year, there is a solar eclipse, and we go through red, and we go through where there's shadow. Yes, Morty? Don't they just claim four blood, blood moons as, as being valid? It makes good, it sells good books, and they make movies out of it. Yeah. They sell, make money yeah. off of it. But I'm back to Hebrews chapter 9, where it says, It's a point of man wants to die, and after this, what? The judgment. the judgment. Does that sell books? Yeah. No. Not too much. Four blood moons. <laughs> that sells books. Does that sell books? Yes. Yeah. Does that four yeah. blood yeah. moons? <laughs> does that sell theater tickets? <laughs> it does. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Does the poor man want to sign after that the judgment? Does that sell books? No. Does that sell theater tickets? I'm sorry, Martha. It's just reality. Oh darn. <laughs> <laughs> I thought for sure there were five. Revelation is a prophecy that describes the end of time and the years leading immediately to the end as a futurist view. There's a dispensational premillennial as well as some historic premillennialists interpret Revelation in this way. And some futurists understand the seven churches as the unfolding of church history. Now, according to our discussion last uh, week, who was the historian and the scientist that came up with that theory. Mm -hmm. That the seven churches of chapter 2 Isaac and 3. Who cool. was it? Oh, Isaac, Isaac Newton. Newton. Isaac Newton. He was a, He's Newton. the first one that proposed it. What years did he live? 1700s. So there's enough church history that had gone by that he could look over his shoulder and says, well, it seems like this makes sense. Mm -hmm. And he's the one that introduced that and some later commentary borrowed from him and uh, took it from there. But it's kind of interesting that area. Now, in, in the premillennial, <coughs> how many people in the, uh, well, I was sharing with you that in the non instrumental Church of Christ, there's one group among the non instrumental Church that are premillennial. And those that are have been disfellowshipped by all the brethren. Predominantly, Assembly of God and Church of God and Baptist, Southern Baptist, 
take the premillennial position. They, they, they predominantly take this, and the one, one that really popularized things was Hal Lindsey and Blake Great Planet Earth, uh, when that came along, and several revival preachers, there's a lot of revival preachers that preach on prophecy, and they popularized that particular position. The mistake some have made is setting dates. Yes. Now the Bible says, of that day and of that hour knoweth what? No, no man. man. Not even the Son of, the Son of God. God. God the Father is the only one that knows the time of the end. And that be what it be what it be. Sells good books. But it sells books. The, uh, I'm looking at the uh, 150 years ago, most of the Christian churches and Churches of Christ, instrumental, took the position of being post millennial. They thought the world was going to get better and better and better and better, and Christ was going to come again and rule for a thousand years. Richard? They actually introduced the 666 as a, a rapture type thing. Tried to introduce it into the instrument of Church of Christ. He went into the colleges. How long ago was that? Oh, that was in the 1960s. Okay, 1960s yeah. it became an issue. That's where the tongues movement got strong in, in the uh, uh, Churches of Christ and the right. Catholic Churches and such. So mm -hmm. Well, you had, you had charismatic renewal, you had uh, disciples renewal, you had they had been within the Roman Catholic Church to bring about spiritual renewal and spiritual awakening. And this was during the hippie age when George was baptizing hippies over in Pat Boone's swimming pool. Uh, Pat Boone was a member of a very legalistic, non-instrumental Church of Christ. And he was going through marital problems, uh, going through divorce, and he did his spiritual renewal. And he wrote a book called Sing a New Psalm. And in his book called Sing a New Psalm, he was uh, introducing speaking in tongues, and they disfellowshipped him for that. Oh, and really? as a movement, the Churches of Christ, non-instrumental, discontinued prayer meeting on Wednesday night. They changed yeah. from prayer meeting to Wednesday night Bible study, yeah. because they were fearful that this was going to be a tidal wave that's going to take over all our churches and brought about. Grove Park Christian Church split over that area. There's a loyal Christian church between Woodland Avenue. There was the Legacy Christian Church, but Ireland was called Lakeland Christian Church, mm -hmm. was a split off there. And so you had a three-way split, or two-way split, in among, even among the independent Christian churches during the 1960s and 1970s, <coughs> over, over spiritual gifts. And uh, uh, but the, the whole thing boils down to, on, on spiritual gifts, either they were to be uh, a generation after the Bible was completed, or there to be when Jesus comes again. And that is the discussion. That which is perfect is come, and that which is in part shall be done away. And one interpretation is that which is perfect is come is James 1.25, the perfect law of liberty. When the Bible came in 95-96 AD, it was completed. And whoever the apostles laid their hands on, that would die with the next generation. And there'd be no more. Hmm. Others would say there'd be a spiritual renewal throughout the whole time. That God is not locked up in a box as He was in the Old Testament. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And uh, the, the those gifts would come as far as in speaking language that was never studied, being able to raise the dead, be able to uh, drink poison without being affected by it, uh, to to have instantaneous knowledge. That was all going to be until Jesus comes again. And uh, I'm just I'm just saying that, and that the position, the Churches of Christ instrumental take in the island of Jamaica is, uh, both are okay in the local church. They did not make it a point of division. They just left it to the local church to decide, and uh, that's where that was particularly left. Now, as far as our official position, if we have an official position, is uh, if folks have a prayer language that they practice at home. Uh, that's fine in the assembly. It has proven divisive in our former experience in among our independent Christian churches. And uh, if uh, we don't want to divide over things, just to have something to divide. <clears throat> that's that's uh, an official, unofficial position. Some people would say a person speaks in tongues is demon possessed. Oh. That's an extreme. Uh, that's that's going. Some folks say it's an emotional, uh, where people are just totally emotionally car carried away. Uh, others would say uh, uh, that uh, the, the people are, are uh, going through some kind of a whatever. Uh, others 
we'll look at it as an angelic language that God speaks through the tongues of men and angels. And Paul's taught that although I speak uh, five words or, or a thousand words in an unknown tongue, better speak five words that the people can understand me. And Paul the Apostle said, I speak in tongues more than all of you. You know why Paul the Apostle spoke in tongues more than all of you? Because he went to Spain, and he went to Rome, and he went to Greece, and he went to Turkey, and he went to Asia Minor, and he went to, uh, throughout the world. And he was equipped to be able to preach the gospel in any language anybody could understand his gospel. Wow. And uh, you, you, uh, you, you read also in Acts chapter 2 that the apostles, there were uh, nations from all around the world gathered there on the day of Pentecost. And the, he talked about the Cretes and the Romans and so on and so forth and all those other languages that were present there. And he, he the preacher Peter, has thought that he preached in Greek when he preached his, his particular sermon, which was the lingua franca, or the common language, the trade language of the world at that time. When I was in school, they came up with Esperanto, and that was supposed to be a language that's going to cover the world. It was an unknown, it was a nonsense invention language. And they decided that once the computer was invented, even the Chinese learned English, and now English has become the lingua franca, the main language for the trade world, business world. So if you run a business, you better know English. If you're going to go overseas and run a tourist bus, you better know English. If you're going to go to China, you better know English. If you're going to run a computer, you better know English. So English today is what Greek was back then. And uh, I was going to translate Bible into a, a, a Haitian Creole tongue. And one of the guys that was professor at Christianville College says, you're wasting your time. <coughs> French mm -hmm. is the prime language in, in Haiti. Mm -hmm. Just like Freedom. English is the prime language, the education language, the official language of the nation. And so certain languages are. I know Ben Alexander, who's a friend of mine, he was a spiritist. Uh, he went through into South America trying to deal with spiritualist mediums and ectoplasmic materializations and all this other. He said when he went down, he was converted to Christ through, for, through religion that uh, was strong on in, in speaking in tongues. But he says when we were in South America, they always spoke to translators in that, that faith. He said, yet we, through the power of the devil, when we were in seance and trance, could speak in tongues and in languages through demonic possession. So he himself says, we didn't need translators in spiritualism. They needed uh, translators in South America when they're doing their revival campaigns in and among uh, Spanish-speaking Hispanic people there in particular. But uh, that's to be another subject for another day. I didn't mean to open up the can of beans. I'm sorry. Uh, that, that's <laughs> another subject for another day. Yeah, can of worms, can of beans. But uh, uh, that's that's uh, can of beans. Uh, can of beans. <laughs> idealist, the idealist view. <laughs> The idea that see Revelation is a non-historical and a uh, non-prophetic drama about spiritualities, and I never ran into this deal before. Idealist is it's just kind of sweet things about everything and it says nothing. It just makes you feel warm and fuzzy that we're going to win, and that's all there is to it. And, and you go home and sleep sleep time doing the bed book. But the uh, they call it an allegory for all times and all places. But the Bible doesn't say Revelation is going to be an allegory. It says there's going to be, it's going to be in signs, it's going to come shortly, and it's going to be signified or put in signs. The images, visions, and dreams are symbols and uh, of experience of the struggle between good and evil throughout time. And, and then they go ahead and say it's a struggle between the kingdom of God and the power of evil. So uh, this, this is some of those particulars. Now we want to go into chapter 2, and uh, we're going to deal with this, this uh, particular. Our backup thought is in Revelation chapter 1, 1 through 8. It's a vision of Christ. It's the revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants, which must soon take place. Shortly, King James says, and that says, soon take place. 
He made it known by sending his angel to a servant, John, in chapter 1, 1 and 2. <coughs> blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written, because the time is near. Notice that the time is near from when John wrote. And whether he wrote it in 96 AD or wrote it in before in the days of Nero. Yes, ma'am. I want to emphasis me. Emphasis means I'm going to underscore it, put a bunch of exclamation points after it. Oh. I'm going to put it in big letters. I'm going to shout it loud. Okay. I'm going to really emphasize. So the word near is, is uh, in emphasis. So just say that's, that's an important word. Okay. Now, he says, right there for what you have seen and what is now and what will take place. And chapter 119, this again is the index to understanding the whole book of Revelation. Three different categories of what is, what will, and what, what, you, what you have seen. Past, present, future. Now, the seven messages of the churches, the interpretation of soon and near and what is. The historicist takes the prophecy to begin to be fulfilled close to the author's lifetime. The preterist is going to say near, soon, and quickly are taken literally. The future says these words refer to the whole of the last days or to the quickness with which Jesus will return. And finally, the idolist says Christ is always at hand, near and quick to save his people. Which is kind of, the idolist, idealist position to me is the most wishy-washy uh, pablum. is baby food. It's Gerber's baby food. Exactly. Interesting thing about Gerber's baby food. The uh, missionaries were feeding their babies Gerber's baby food in the mission field. And you know what's on the side of a jar of every, every baby food jar? Is a picture of what? A picture of a baby. And the natives stopped going to the chapel and stopped going to the church of the missionaries. You know why? <coughs> they thought they were cannibals. They were eating babies. Oh, oh my goodness. Uh, really? Really. Eating really babies. Even though it was, wow. it was mush prunes and mush peas and mush carrots. Oh my. Because it had a baby on the jar, they really thought they were cannibals. And they had to actually take all the labels off their baby food jars and destroy them so that the local people didn't think they are cannibals. But uh, that shows misunderstanding and interpretation. Major. But big time. Why don't you want to go to church? Because you guys eat babies. Now don't laugh. In the 1960s, during the Cold War, you know what they call the Christians? The Russians call the Christians? You guys take communion. It says, take eat, this is my body. Take drink, this is my blood. Those Christians are cannibals. They eat right. blood bodies and they drink blood. They're vampires and they're cannibals. And this is what the atheist communists propagate in their magazines about our Christian faith. That we're a bunch of cannibals. And blood-sucking vampires. I don't like that. That, that stinks. That shows how ignorant well, the enemy is. Political boy, for what? Oh, yeah, that's all part of it. Now, John writes to the seven churches in the province of Asia. He says, Grace and peace to you from him who is. Now, in Paul's writing, he talks about grace, mercy, peace. Grace is unmerited favor. Mercy is you're supposed to get a punishment, but you don't receive it. Grace is you get something you don't deserve. And peace is pleasantness of heart and mind. And in a lot of Paul's writing, he says, Grace, mercy, peace, or grace and peace be to you. So John does the same thing in his writing. He talks about grace and peace. And he talks about Jesus who is, and who was, and who is to come. Now in the book of John, we read about Jesus Christ being the I Am. He says, Who, who are you? I am that I am. That means God is the eternal present tense. He's got no past. He's got no present. He's got no future. He's eternal. He's from beginning. He was before the beginning. Because in the beginning, God. So what came first? God or the beginning? God came before the beginning. So God had no beginning. Well, who was God's father? And who's God's father's father? And who's God's father's father? And who's God's father's father's father? Who was God's great great grandfather? There was none. There was none because he's the I am. He did not have a beginning. He always was. I'm trying to figure out what that means. 
what I am? <coughs> well, I am is the present. He is, you are, we are, he is, 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 was, were, am. I am, ever present. I am is present, I shall be is future, I was is past. I am means now. So God is now. So we use the word now. And uh, he says, From the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now this word firstborn from the dead is something Jehovah's Witnesses really like to run with, don't they, Martha? Yep. They make Jesus being God's first creation. Oh. Well, now the Greek says... You ever heard them talk? <laughs> yeah, they, he was created, one of the created angels, just like Lucifer was a created angel, and Michael was a created mm -hmm. angel, and uh, Gabriel was a created angel, and Jesus was a created angel, so therefore they're all, he was just an angel. And yet the Bible says he's made man a little lower than the angels, but he says he's put Jesus above the angels. And he made the angels servants, even to serve us, and it's kind of interesting, the Bible says that we who are Christians are going to not only judge angels, we're going to judge the world. Now, this is quite a powerful, you know, went through court today and these <coughs> judges do what they think is right. And he condemns Christians going to law against Christians. He says, you ought to have spiritual people that be able to make these spiritual decisions. Because... You don't need to take your problems before carnal men that don't have the Holy Spirit living within them to give holy, spiritual, uh, right thinking conclusions. You need to have a spiritual maturity. But he still says the saints shall judge the world and the saints shall judge angels. Now people quote or misquote the scripture. Judge not that you be not judged. You can't judge me because I'm going to, you know, you got a stick in your eye. You can't judge me. You know, the Bible says, judge righteous judgments. And the Bible also says, by their fruits you shall know them. And so maybe we can't be judges, but maybe we can be fruit inspectors. Because the Bible says, by their fruits you shall know them. And their fruits are what they be. Uh, he talks about Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, firstborn from the dead. The Greek <clears throat> word for firstborn is source of creation. John 1, all things in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And there was nothing made that was not made by Him. And later on, verse 14, I believe, he says, He took on flesh and dwelt among us. And this is the Word of life, which John proclaimed in the wilderness. So all things were made by Him. He's creator. It was interesting, whenever that group, that cohort of soldiers came out, I don't know if there's seven or eight hundred of them came out to arrest <laughs> Jesus. Are you the one we seek? And the King James says, I am he. The Greek says, I am. And the Bible says they fell backwards. Are you the one we seek? And there's two interpretations. One commentator says, they're so surprised that he owned up to being the one that came to arrest that they fell backwards. Wow! Well, this is a first. Usually, you end up yeah. I take the uh, the uh, Fifth Amendment, so we're not going to betray ourselves in any way. But other commentators says he declared before them that he was the very Creator, God that created them in the beginning. And you're coming out to arrest me to nail me to a cross, and I'm the one that created this universe, and I created every corpuscle in your bloodstream, and every capillary, and I know every hair in your head. It's kind of neat when Jesus was writing in the sand all the sins of the men that brought the woman that's supposed to be stoned. He must have had fun. You know, yeah. 9 o'clock Tuesday evening you're with uh, Rabbi so-and-so's wife. So-and-so, uh, so-and-so, you're out cavorting around. So-and-so, so-and-so, you were drunk. So-and-so, and he write all these sins for all we know in the sand and one by one they dropped their stones and, and left. Jesus knew them better than they knew themselves. Now, the first church we want to read is in, in Ephesus. And let's uh, read chapter 2 and have somebody read that first section on Ephesus. Whoever's got that handy. Sandy, go ahead and read that. To the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, 
and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, and that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. Yet <clears throat> I hold this against you, you have forsaken your first love. Mm. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repent and do the things that you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its mm. place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Mm. Okay, we did a lengthy mm. discussion. We dedicated one whole class to Ephesus, and so we'll, we'll do a lot of that repeating. But what was the famous temple there in Ephesus that we remember? Temple to whom? Diana. 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 Diana of the Ephesians. Yes, Miss Christie. Do you have like the map of the Asia Minor that I can be able to? You have one that I can. Put Next. Uh, yes and no. Uh, the, 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 I didn't run those off in these sets of notes, but there is that map available. All you got to do is Google search and just yeah. print one off if you want to. Google search your seven churches behind because I included a map last time, if you remember. But I didn't have it in the notes. Uh, the, the notes are Dan Park when he does Romans is going through six commentaries. Uh, going through Revelation, I'm dealing with three different sources rather than six. So Dan's going to overwhelm you with quoting from different things. Now, if you've got this red bound book right here, these are Jerry Weller's notes. And if you would look on page, what is it? Seven Churches of Asia. This is the best set chart on the seven churches right here in the book. So this little red book is a reference of charts to refer back to. It simplifies everything, but it's a major church dealing with the seven churches of Asia. Now, let's deal with... Uh, Can I let me ask one question? Yes, sir. Didn't you say that they dug up and found these uh, uh, statues to... In, in oh yeah, yeah. I, I, they 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 look like a uh, pig laid on his back, look like yeah. a sow, multi-breasted woman. I didn't mean to bring that all up. And that that was where they shouted, "Greatest Diana of the Ephesians." This was the center of Diana worship, and that's why it was one of the fourth largest centers of the Roman world and Greek world prior to the Roman world. But notice here. Here's Ephesus, here's Patmos. Ephesus is after, after John was released when, who was it, Domitian died? Mm -hmm. He's released and went to Ephesus. He served as an elder there in that church. And he's buried there, his gravesite is there. And this is where he spent his latter years. That congregation as a church, I think, was about 20,000 in, in attendance. It was an early mega church. Yet today you go to that city of Ephesus and the harbor's all silted up and you've got to go several miles inland to find ancient Ephesus and there's all kinds of mosques and there's a little bit of 1% of the town is Christian, Catholic and anything else, Jewish and 99% are all Muslim. Muslims. <laughs> but you notice he praised them and not all the churches he praised the seven churches but he praised them for hard work and perseverance. His biggest criticism was very worth the servant in itself. You lost your first love. Mm -hmm. You know, when first a person comes out of the baptistry and they just have a big smile and hallelujah on their lips, and, and you just see that enthusiasm. But then as they get older and older and older and older, they get old and stogy. And, okay, preacher, I'm not going to get too excited. You know, because I know... We got somebody getting baptized this Saturday, but you know, so what? You know, yep, yep, it's just gonna be whatever. And I know we gotta have a praise and worship service, and I'll try to get there in time for the praise and worship, but 
if we don't get there, don't miss me. And I know we got Bible study, but we'll get there if we get there. If we don't get there, don't feel too bad. Because I had to wait and watch the late, late movie on TV, and that's more right. important than being in church. Yep, that's it. <laughs> I threatened to put a set of Easter lilies on the organ, a set of poinsettias on the piano. And one of my elders wives got on me, Brother Richard, don't you dare. Why? Well, it was Easter, and I was going to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and Happy what? Easter until I see him next year. And a friend of mine who went and went Peg, Jim didn't never do anything like that, would he? He's too nice to be <laughs> He is, yeah. <laughs> and a friend of mine who set up, took a ladder and took it out in the park. And during the worship service, he was preaching there. And he just went out and sat down on the ladder in the park. That's where they found him. And he, it was the idea of, you've left your first love, you need to get on fire. Leif Culver did something he really had to fight himself. One Sunday night, that's back when churches had Sunday night services in the old days, he didn't come to church. Deliberately did not come to church. And he had to really fight with his, his spiritual conviction of not showing up for church. Why? And it was, you know, church starts at 6 o'clock. And it's 6.15, no Leif. Go ahead and start the song service. Leif's not here. Where's Leif? 6.30, and the song service is over. Where's Leif? They went ahead and served communion for those who didn't get it. Where's Leif? Something terrible might have happened. He might have got to turn, turn his tractor upside down on top of him all that. So finally, after the services, they went out to the far, Leif Culver farm to find out where Culver was. He's out there doing some chores, you know, just working on the, out in the yard. And uh, well, Brother Culver, you know, we thought something was wrong. He said, well, nothing's wrong. I just didn't feel like coming to church today. <laughs> well, you got that you have to He says, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. All right. So, I don't guarantee that for every preacher. I know Dick Ellis got up and preached in Tomahawk on modesty for the women. And he preached that sermon on Sunday morning. And he taught about modesty. And then the next Sunday come by, you know what he preached on? Same sermon, same main division, same text, same everything. He preached the same sermon a second time. Guess what he did next Sunday? Same sermon the third time. He said, why in the world are you doing that? He says, well, when you start repenting, start practicing sermon number A, I can go on to number B. But until you start A, then we're going to have to stick on it until you're ready for number B. And that's the way the old preachers were back in those days. Now people, oh, you hear my feelings, I'm going to go someplace else where they tickle my ears, make me feel good. So, uh, anyway, didn't that make you feel good and comfortable? But that's the way it was in the old days. Forgot their first love. And he exhorted them to do one thing, what? Repent. Repent. And they'd be rewarded. They'd have the right to eat from the tree of life. Now it's interesting, it talked about certain doctrines. He talked about the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. And in Acts chapter 6 verse 5, it talks about Nicholas as one of the first seven deacons of the church. That were the servants that whenever people said the apostles are so busy trying to serve the tables and the mm -hmm. Gentile widows and all the other, let's set out seven men full of the Holy Spirit and good works that we can put over this work. And Nicholas was among them. Here we have later years where Nicholas becomes a beginner of a cult. Oh. And didn't he warn in Acts chapter 20 that there would be wolves arising from among yourselves? They're going to try to devour the flock. And so history, tradition says the Nicolaitans, their doctrine was begun by the by Nicholas. Uh -oh. And uh, this was similar doctrine as what happened to some of the churches out in California. What they would do is everybody would uh, toss their shoes, everybody in the church would take their shoes off and uh, scramble them up and then you went over and you traded shoes and then you went home with the lady that you picked her shoes and she went home with the man that she picked his shoes and they shacked up after in fornication or adultery. And this is the way the churches brought together a nice fellowship. And you talk about the doctrine of Jezebel, the doctrine of Nicolaitans, uh, that happened in churches in California, and Morty knows it happened in other states. Amen. But uh, there's ungodly things that go on, and you usually think it's the preacher 
that's a loose cannon chasing after women. When I'm getting my ears pinned back, I've, I've, lately it's been the last two churches, it's not that the preacher ran off with the choir, lady in the choir, it's a preacher's wife that's been catting around acting like the cat bird. So now that women have the right to hold their cigarette like a man and drink a can of beer like a man and, and to work like a man and act like a man, now they can fornicate like a man, and uh, even if they're the preacher's wife. And the, the, the church doesn't discipline them. They don't send them for counseling. They take a church down in Plant City, and she's now head of the ladies' fellowship, and he's the preacher of this new church, and, and everything's hunky-dory. <laughs> Happened just six months ago. Oh, Sorry. No. Really? Mm -hmm. We got Smyrna. I need somebody to read the next section here on Smyrna. Uh, to the angel of the church in Smyrna, Smyrna write, These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. I know your afflictions and your poverty. Yet you are rich. I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. Okay. What does that mean, you uh, rich? <coughs> you rich? Yeah, well, I got money. You got money. <laughs> you got all kinds of credit cards. You got you no. got uh, investments, stocks and bonds, and lands and apartment rentals, and then you got uh, ten cars, and you got <laughs> twenty houses, and you got uh, lands and goods, and you're. They, they claim to be rich. They had a nice, 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 they had it nice. <clears throat> he had no, no criticism for them. He only exhorted them to be faithful. Now that's kind of interesting. He didn't clobber the Smyrna church. He called them rich in faith. So here you got Ephesus and here's the next church, Smyrna. Now in Smyrna, there was a temple to one of the pagan gods, and the Germans went over there and removed the entire temple, every lock, stock, block, column, and they moved this over to Germany and reconstituted, rebuilt the whole thing as one of their museums. And this was the synagogue of Satan. When we were in Smyrna, we saw the place where that temple used to be, but it isn't anymore. Because the Germans packed it up and put it into a museum, or just built it as a museum. And that was all part of. It. But the synagogue of Satan was one of the pagan temples of that particular era, area. And uh, but you notice in verse seven, he that has an ear, Christie says, "What's he supposed to do? Let him what? Hear." And he says, uh, "And I'll give you the tree of life." which is in the paradise of God. Verse 10, Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt in the second death. Okay, what's the first death? Uh, death to sin. When you die. Oh, okay, when you die. Physical death. Right. Okay, death that's, that's the, the, okay, the second death is what? Going to heaven. Or hell. Oh. Or hell. Either or. The word death means what? Separation. When the body separates from the soul or the spirit. Whenever spirit and body come together, they become a soul. Whenever body goes back to dust and spirit goes back to God, no longer do you have a soul. Your soul is when body and spirit come together, then you become that, level, that, 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 that soul. Death, dust, spirit back to God who gave it. That spirit stands till judgment day when the body it will be brought back and become an eternal body. And then that body will be either going to paradise or to torments after judgment day. And that's uh, where he talks about the second death. He's going to overcome that particular second death. So he talks about being faithful and uh, 
he's, he's, he's dealing with their all the, the, the frustration they've had as far as he knew their works and, and their poverty and all those things that they didn't put up with. So we're going to stop here. We're going to have Morty take over the, the well, I'll ask first of all if there's any questions you have up to this time before we go into prayer. We'll go ahead and offer to them. You any, commented, any questions you may have? Well, did you comment last week that, uh, uh, was it Newton or somebody said that the seven churches were seven eras? Mm -hmm. Was that Isaac Newton? Isaac Newton. That? We had that discussion when you were back in the back setting up. Martha answered that question with 100% on her test. <laughs> and that's the last page of your notes. In the, the section of notes I gave you, the last page of your notes in the handout I gave you a month ago. The one that goes with the rose, rose, uh, rose uh, notes. Let's see, Luke, Morgan, why don't we have you guys take up offering?